So um, there's two questions, one online, one offline. I'm going to merge it into one question because it's logically um, the same. So um, the, the online part says that uh, it, it's been noted that you're, you're somewhat allergic to, to dystopian scenarios, especially when it comes to the internet. There is a kind of unsaid assumption that the internet, you know, rules around censorship, self heals, whatever, right? Because the trust machine makes it happen. Um, but there, there still exists agent, uh, we would say, that because of our dependence on something that heals this quickly, uh, they would make concerted attacks. Uh, and the, both the inherent brittleness of the protocols as well as the coordinated you know, maliciousness uh, to, to build structures that will subvert this kind of um, infrastructure. So, of course, people talk about cyber wars a lot, but it may not be a, a war, it may just be sabotage or whatever. And there are agents that are intending to, you know, making internet to, to into this Arabian repair. So what do you say about this? Y yes, I think that it's inevitable that there is going to be malicious attacks on the internet to try to bring it down in sections and they will be successful. Certain areas, certain parts of the internet will go down and it'll be very, very pragmatic. I think it's going to be, um, uh, you know, if, if the internet in the U S went down, it would be devastating for a number of days, months, whatever. And the, the fear that would cause would be very, very significant. Um, I, 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 so let me say a couple of things. One is I think it's going to be very uh, – it's almost certain that um, cyber conflict will result in some kind of uh, local, national level disaster. Um, it's, it's much more difficult, if not impossible, to take the entire Internet as a whole down. That's, that's – uh, it's a much bigger project, and it's not clear what the motivation is for that. Um, and, and so I think even engineering-wise, this is a very, very difficult problem to do. And that's much more unlikely that the entire thing goes down. Just like it's easy to injure a person, and it's harder to kill them. Okay, I mean, you can injure someone very easily, and, and so oftentimes injuring them is enough. Um, so, so I think there will be injury and illness and disease on the Internet deliberately made. Um, and some of this will be pretty serious. And I think uh, the one, uh, one thing that I worry about is the fact that we collectively as humans don't have a consensus on what is acceptable and what is not. So um, the fact that there is no agreement among nations, the U.S., China, Russia, and the other Europe nations, Taiwan, presumably, on what is acceptable and what is not in terms of um, we have normal laws of warfare or conflict for other aspects like you can do this, um, you know, people in military uniform are legitimate targets, but women and children aren't. You know, we have rules, but we don't have any rules for cyber. And it may take a very terrible disaster before people, before the governments will agree to have those rules. And so um, I think the fact that we don't have those rules right now is very is something to be concerned about. There are people trying to work on them. Should we allow robots to kill people? There's lots of things that we haven't figured out yet. And so... This is a huge opportunity for people in this room or others to become involved in trying to make those rules. Um, I have to say that we don't know. There's lots of disagreements on these questions, and it will take a number of years before we have any consensus if we do. So um, we can. this is a... Um, a dilemma, it's a, a threat, a worry, but it's also an opportunity for people to be involved in trying to make it go in the direction they think it should go.
between state parties, there, there are like the Talim manual on cyber warfare and things like that. But I think uh, one, one of KK's very good point is that with the norm around the internet governance uh, is open for everybody to participate. It has always been like this. But I, but I would I'd like to say it's not just about the non-governmental. Right, right now, there's a group, international group called Responsible Robotics, who are putting together uh, petitions and white papers uh, arguing for their side that, that we should outlaw um, device auto, uh, robo devices that can kill humans that should not be allowed in war. So um, it, it it right now because governments don't have a solid um, policy and uh, strategy, th they are actually can be influenced even by civilians who have who care and think a lot about this. So the opportunity is in actually influencing your national governments. So question 18, if it's okay with you. Um, in, in Taiwan, as the digital minister and an anarchist, uh, we've been experimenting using AI facilitator, for example, to make regulations about Uber and so on, and generally spreading this multi-stakeholder approach. But still, we operate within a national or local governmental context. And a reader wants to ask, but are there, will there be um, alternatives and two uh, directions? One is that the holos that you mentioned, would it essentially nullify the, the sovereignty and create a planetary government and or driven by intense personalization, we fragment into ad hoc tribes like the, the belief system that Cory Doctorow wrote about. Um, when we talk about government, government is very conservative, very slow. It's one of the slowest changing institutions or, or, or Stuart Brand's uh, terminology, one of the slowest changing layers that we have in the layer uh, scales of change. Government is very slow. And, and there's many reasons why that's good because it, it, it's conservative. It wants to conserve things. And so um, I, I think the kind of change, but I think it nonetheless will change over time. And technology will have a lot to do with that. Um, I think that the relative power and role of the national governments will decrease in relationship to the power that cities, city, municipal, regional governments have, and the power that an emerging planetary government will have. So. So I don't think that state or national governments are going to go away anytime soon. I do think that their relative power compared to the, uh, say, the power of Taipei uh, City or Kaohsiung or Taichung would also decrease in relationship to those city governments. And I think that there will be an emerging planetary government, which will slowly happen and slowly accrue more power. So if we, you know, if you look at the far, far future, yeah, I think there will be a, a, a big shift. But this is going to be a very slow process, and um, uh, and a very, a very frustrating process because it is so slow. And so um, uh, the one advantage I can see out of this is that the planetary layer of governance can accelerate the change because people will, will be able to learn from each other. I mean, historically, it's been very difficult for something that works in one part of the world to have an influence on somewhere else. But as we realize that we have a global economy and a global emerging global culture that and global governance will also um, transmit things that work and don't work faster so we'll be paying more attention to what works other places and that i think would be one way in which um, this can accelerate which but still will be frustratingly slow so I think one one um, factor that will again accelerate 
the innovations and change in say nation state governments is going to be competition the fact that there is a scarcity of talent worldwide and a talent a scarcity and a in a um a demand for investment money and uh, uh people with ideas and so um with the increased mobility that we have in the world where students can come to the u.s or go back to their home um, they're going to go where there is the government that's most supportive of innovation and change and stuff because they could go if they don't like it they can go somewhere else and so that kind of mobility is very very important and will really drive the governments to become better at what they do for their citizens because if if they don't people will leave good people the best people will leave not just the refugees and those who have nothing else it's the ones who have the most who will um leave to go live somewhere else or work somewhere else and that that competition will drive more than anything else will drive governments to become better more efficient more equitable more innovative that's great um so um slightly more heavy than uh, question 23 um and uh you, you mentioned yourself that in your book uh one character <coughs> is <coughs> notably missing that is crispr that is <coughs> the gene editing technology mm -hmm. and so um instead of you know just aliens and human beings <coughs> human beings may want to edit itself into subspecies sure. and as you said <clears throat> there's different places that has different regulations and people will flock mm -hmm. to the places with regulation that allow them to be right, right, the right. kind of person they, they want. So the question right. is that <clears throat> combining those two trends, we, we will still have a humanity, a, a union, a holos, or several unique species. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in the long run, and we get, I, mean, I want to emphasize that the biological change is not following Moore's law right now. There are certain aspects of DNA information sequencing are, but the, the larger scale changes in our genome or whatever are, are, are very slow. And so um, not in 30 years, maybe 50, 100 years, we will have, we'll have the beginnings of the ability to speciate. And I think it's, I think it's very likely that we will fork as a species that will have many different paths. Um, there will be some humans who will absolutely refuse to have any manipulation of their genes or their children's genes, and they will remain very, very pure and very um, sacred. And then there'll be others who want to enhance humanity very, very quickly. So I, I, I think it's, pretty certain that in the long term we have forks and we'll have multiple species which by the way we did before long ago there were multiple human species and um you know we got rid of them the the and it's not really clear whether we bred with them whether we killed them or whether we just were more efficient and they died out. We don't know. Um, but it's not a new, uh, it's not a new experience for us to be inhabiting a world with multiple human species because we have already done that before. So, um, yes, I think, uh, but, but I have to say that this is a long way off. It's, it's, um, not in 30 years and probably not even in 50 years or even in 100 years. But it w probably will happen. That would be question 25, um, all washed over by machines of loving grace. Um, so, um, yeah, it's essentially asking a, a post-scarcity world, as, um, you know, a culture like a science fiction world. Um, nobody has to work to stay alive and a machine, you know, takes care of people's needs. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, would you have, what would you say that that would happen then? Well, um, 
I mean, I, I certainly think the that has been a utopian dream for a long time, is that we have a world where we don't have to work. And, you know, most people say, well, that's that would be progress. Um, and so the question... Um, so, so I, I spend I spend time myself around a lot of people who don't have to work. I mean, in the sense that they have enough money that they don't have to work, and it's really interesting because um, they to to see what they're doing. And f first of all, um, they're pretty happy, and secondly, they're doing interesting things that no one else is doing. They're the same thing that a young, starving young person is doing, to hope, hoping that they eventually have enough money so they don't have to work. But they're doing things that no one else is doing at all. So I'm imagining a world in which people have a whole different variety of responses of what they would do if they didn't have to work. And there will certainly be some who will just play video games forever, and there will be others who will, you know, fund uh, animal shelters, or they will work to correct the imbalances and justice, whatever it is. And um, I, I think, in general, I'm guessing that the good will outweigh the negative. There will be some negative, but I, I suspect that the good will outweigh the negative. All right. Thank you so much for, for this conversation. And let's work toward a future where we can all play video games, find animal shelters, and fix the injustices in the world. Um, thank you again for, for this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, really. Thank you for um, all appearing this morning, uh, for asking great questions. Thank you uh, for being readers of my book. And um, I hope that uh, the next time I go to Taiwan, uh, maybe uh, we can all meet. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you.